He's alive, and we're all forgiven. Heaven's gates are open wide. Let's uh, give our God thanks and praise this morning as we begin our worship. We thank you, our God and Father, that you love us, you care for us each and every day. Your mercies are new every morning. Most of all, on this Easter Resurrection Sunday, we give you thanks for your plan of salvation, that Jesus Christ was willing to come and live his life here on earth, die, be our Savior, and that through your power you raised him again, that he might have eternal life and we might have life to follow. Bless us as we worship you this morning. We pray that all that is said and done, the music, the words, the scripture, everything will be done to your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 
It's good to have all who are visiting with us. It's good to see David, Margaret, and I don't know Andrea's friend's name, but it's good to have you with us. And I'm glad to have my fiance Janita with us as well today, and we're uh, uh, looking forward to spending the day together. Have a busy day. Uh, if you don't have somewhere else to eat Easter lunch, we're going to have lunch in the back. Come and join us, and we'll fellowship together. And we can't, don't eat too much, because a lot of us have to sing at 6 o'clock. So uh, we're coming back at 6 for an Easter cantata and uh, a little bit of fellowship time after the cantata. So busy day. Uh, let's praise the Lord and fellowship <clears throat> with the Lord together. Any other announcements that need to be made? Do you have a mission? No, nothing you can say today. We're going to break okay. the history today. Next week, we should have a board meeting next, next Saturday at 10 o'clock. Saturday at 1 o'clock. 10 o'clock, is that here? 10. 10. Okay. And I've double booked. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have a funeral to do at 2 o'clock in Brightland. Let's continue in worship with our call to worship. With the Church of Christ down the ages, we share the Easter greeting. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. From buried dreams and goodness destroyed, He is great good news. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Over state-sponsored terror, the power of the sword, in the stranglehold of death, the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. From dryness and tears and the anguish of loss, he is great good news. The Lord is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here is a true story. Jesus of Nazareth, sent from God, filled with the power of the Spirit, went about healing and doing good, preaching peace to God's own people. Give thanks to the living God, whose love persists forever. <clears throat> Jesus was nailed to a tree, executed, dead, and buried, but God raised him from the dead. Stones that the builders rejected have become the chief cornerstone. <clears throat> Christ is appointed Savior and Judge of the living and the dead. And everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. This is the work of the living God. It is marvelous in our eyes. If I could have the choir come forward with your Is He Worthy? Is anyone able to break the seal and 
Two scripture lessons this morning, one from the Gospels, <clears throat> one of the accounts of the resurrection from the, Matthew, the 28th chapter, the first seven verses. Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a, seer, a severe earthquake had occurred for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. And his appearance was like lightning and his clothes as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, just as he said. Come see the place where he was lying, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going ahead of you into Galilee, and there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. And from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, and I'm going to read it's the scripture, the first 11 verses. We'll also be looking at later on um, more of this chapter. But 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 11. Paul says, Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you receive, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I have preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received from Christ, that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, 
that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve and after he appeared to more than 500 brethren at one time most of whom remain alive until now but some have fallen asleep and then he appeared to James and then to all the apostles and last of all as to one untimely born Paul referring to himself and he appeared to me also for I am the least of the apostles and not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God but by the grace of God I am what I am and his grace toward me did not prove vain but I labored even the more than all of them and yet not I but the grace of God with me whether then it was I are they so we preach to you who have believed may god bless the reading of his word this morning today on this resurrection sunday we celebrate that jesus is alive today and that because he lives, that changes everything in this world and the next. I grew up listening to a hymn that I'm going to read to you this morning called He Lives. We don't sing it a whole lot anymore, but it was part of my childhood and probably part of most of our childhoods. And it talks about serving a risen life Savior, and it ends with the fact I know he lives because he's in my heart. Listen to the first verse, or follow along, page 232, hymn 232, if you'd like. But this talks about our daily experience with knowing Jesus. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he's living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along this narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how, I know he lives, he lives within my heart. And that was enough for me as a child and a teenager growing up here. It's really enough for all of us. But at 18, I went away to college. And I started studying theology and studying the Word more faithfully than I had before. And I also met Dr. David Dean. And he had uh, a profound influence on my life. Richard had a great influence on me after I came here to be your pastor, knowing him in his later years. I knew Cameron from childhood is an evangelist here and then it's a youth minister working for him and he always had a great influence on my life but probably dr david dean had the biggest influence on my life ever and i profoundly remember two things he told me and all of the students don't let the limits of your understanding be the limits of your faith there are things in scripture and things we encounter in God's word we don't understand the pre-existence of Christ the virgin birth the fact of the Trinity that God is three in one all of those things are difficult to understand and even the resurrection is difficult <coughs> to understand but yet we need to believe it because it is in God's word Amen. and then the other thing that Dr. St. Dean told us and it became my mantra throughout my adult life. You ask me how I know he lives? The Bible tells me so. And I considered myself, I, I admired Dr. Dean greatly, and I wanted to feel like I was some sort of a theologian. So I started repeating that after Dr. Dean. And it became my verse or my thing to say for life. And it's certainly true. <coughs> You ask me now how I know he lives, the Bible tells me so. But recently I figured out something else, and I'd like to share a couple of things with you this morning. 
It's not an either or. It's not either we believe it in our hearts because we've experienced God or we know it for a fact because God's word tells us. It's both. It's both and. And at times in our life, we feel it in our hearts. At other times, we have drifted away from the Lord Jesus and distress, death, grief, loss of jobs, loss of employment, all sorts of things separate us from understanding and feeling that Jesus is alive and well in our hearts. And we need to count on God's word at that point to know it for fact, the fact of the resurrection. Resurrection, And at other times, it is very imminent in our hearts as well. And we feel and we know the presence of Jesus in our hearts, in our lives. So it's not one or the other, it's both. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and start with verse 11 or verse 12 where we left off. And this section of scripture is called in my Bible, the fact of the revelation resurrection and Paul makes an argument about the resurrection of Christ in this thing in this section of scripture now if Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead but how do some say there is no resurrection of the dead does that sound familiar are the people in our world people all around you that say this is just a fairy tale Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. That doesn't happen. It's not part of what happens in this world. We encounter people like that all the time. And yet we know if there is no resurrection of the dead, not only, not only is there no future resurrection, but Christ has not been raised. But we know better than that. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. Your faith is also in vain. I might as well sit down and be quiet and not say anything else. And there's no reason for us to be at church on a Sunday morning. We could out, be out eating or enjoying an Easter egg hunt or whatever else you want to do. There's no reason to be here worshiping a risen Savior. But it's true. It's not true that Christ has not been raised. It is true that he has been raised. Moreover, verse 15, moreover we are found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ from the dead who he <coughs> did not raise. So we're liars. If we're going around telling people that Jesus is risen from the dead and it's not true if it didn't happen, we are liars. We're not telling the truth, Paul says. But then Paul goes on to say, For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless and you're still in your sins. Even more trouble. Our faith is worse, worthless and our sins aren't forgiven. We're still in our sins if Christ wasn't raised from the dead. Verse 18 and 19, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. There's no hope for your loved ones, for your spouse, for your parents. There's no hope for any of us at death. It's all. Life is over. Kesara, sara. It's finished if there's no resurrection of the dead. But we know... <coughs> that Christ has been raised from the dead. If we've only hoped in Christ in this life, if we've only hoped and it's not true, we are of all men to be most pitied. If it's not true and we have no hope of resurrection, then for believing this and preaching this, we are of all people to be most pitied. But Verse 20, the transition, Paul has said all of these what ifs and why nots, but now he transitions in verse 20. But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. So Christ is the first fruits, and we'll go into a little more about that 
what that means in a little while. But I want to digress back to thinking about he lives within my heart and look at three examples of people experiencing the risen Christ. Peter, Paul, and Mary. Not the singing group of the 60s, but Peter, the Apostle Peter, the Apostle Paul, and Mary Magdalene. Let's look at uh, Mark 16, verses 6 and 7. Just for a little background, verse 5, Entering a tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. One of the angels tells its angels in another passage, they went, um, and he said to them, Do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, he is in the place where they he is not in the place where they laid him, but go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. Why did the the angel single out and say, and Peter, the disciples and Peter? Anybody have any thoughts on that? What had Peter just done? Denied Christ. Denied Christ. He denied Christ. Do you think he was feeling part of the group and feeling like he belonged? Jesus took special pains, special time to let Peter know that he was still cared about, he was still one of Jesus' disciples, and that he mattered. Jesus does that to each of us, each and every day. It may not be calling us by name, it may not be a personal encounter where we see Jesus, but Jesus does that in our lives each and every day in some way, and we know Jesus is alive because of that. Turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 20. We sing a song in the cantata tonight. I've just seen Jesus, and this is Mary's account. But Mary was standing outside the tomb, weeping. So as she wept, she stopped and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white while sitting, and one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. And when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. And Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Can you imagine the feeling in Mary's heart when she realized she was talking to the risen Savior? <coughs> it's important to know Jesus not only because the Bible says so, but because we know him deep inside our heart. Paul says in our scripture lesson, 1 Corinthians 15, that he was one unkindly born, and that he isn't deserved to be an apostle. But let's look at Acts chapter 15, or chapter 9.
begins that Saul was still breathing threats of murder against the disciples. And it goes down in the verse 3 as he was traveling. It happened that he was approaching Damascus. Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. And he fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and it will be told to you what you must do. Saul of Tarsus thought he was a righteous man, thought he was doing the right thing because the gospel that he heard was untrue. But then he met Jesus on the Damascus Road, In his life was never the same again. He became the great missionary, the Apostle Paul, who established churches all over the Eastern, the modern, the ancient world. The Apostle Paul, who established churches, who preached the gospel, who shared the word of God all over, all because he had a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now it was after the resurrection and after the ascension, so when Paul says he was one untimely born, he means that he didn't see Jesus in the flesh until Jesus had ascended. But yet Jesus encountered Paul and Paul became a changed person. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Pick up in verse 20 again. But now Christ has been raised from the dead the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by a man came resurrection of the dead, for as in all, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and after that those who are at Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he hands over the kingdom to God and Father, whom he has abolished all rule and all authority and all power. He must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet, and the last enemy is death. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the first fruits of resurrection, and because of that, we have the promise of eternal life. If you know what first fruits mean as a farmer or someone who cultivates things, you, I've seen apple trees begin, the apples start out as being green as a gourd and they begin to have hints of yellow and red and then they turn, unless they're, unless they're yellow delicious, they turn all red, bright red, and you know they're ripening. And the first one you see, you know there's going to be plenty more of them coming because of the first fruits, are strawberries. I used to pick strawberries for a father-in-law, and we'd see just green berries, and then there'd be a hint of red, and they'd start to all turn red, and I would eat one, pick one, eat one, pick one. I love fresh strawberries. Or if you look out here in another month or so, you'll see those crepe myrtles come alive. There's some across the street that are early already, but from June to almost Labor Day, you see red, vivid reds and pinks on those crepe myrtles. Once you see the first one coming, you know there's going to be more. The first fruits. Jesus Christ's resurrection, which we celebrate today, is the first fruits of resurrection. And because we knew, we know that Jesus rose from the dead, 
we know that this life is not all there is. Jesus is going to come back someday. And when he comes back, he's going to claim his church and all who have believed in him and all who have perished before us will be raised from the dead and we will live forever with Jesus, our Lord and Savior, in his kingdom. That's what the resurrection today means to us. It means more is to come and we have every assurance and every promise that we will be raised from the dead. And because of that, everything in the world changes. No other religion, no other doctrine or teaching can say what we say. Jesus Christ is risen. We serve a risen Lord and Savior. Amen. Tomb. 
They brought burial spices of plenty, but when they arrived at the cave, they discovered his grave was empty. When his friends entered the tomb, they found burial cloths of linen. He had done just as he had promised. Yes, Jesus had risen. You want to hold that piece? You can hold it. There you go. Jesus died for our sins. He paid the ultimate price. Now his kingdom is our present. He has given us eternal life. That heavy rock couldn't hold him. Jesus needed to be free. He conquered death to save us, to save both you and me. Let this empty egg remind you of the tomb that was found there. Although his body is gone, he can be found everywhere. He is in the blooming flowers and the emerging butterflies. He is in each and every raindrop and the cloud within the sky. Easter is Jesus raised from the dead. He is our hope and joy, our life's daily bread. Jesus arose from the grave to him be glorified. For Jesus has arisen, yet Jesus is alive. 1 Peter 1, 3. Praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And that is why our egg is empty, because it was a stone, right? It was a tomb. And on Easter Sunday, the tomb was empty. Praise God for that, right? There are so many that believe that you have to check your brain at the door to become a Christian or to be a Christian, but we went over in Sunday school today some of the proofs of the resurrection, and it is one of the most well-attested events in the history of the world. Um, I will have a resource available that did not come in that I can give to anyone who wants to read more about that later, but it's not stupid to believe in the resurrection. Um, it's kind of credulous not to believe it in light of all the evidence that there is. Let's stand together as we celebrate.
Jesus is alive and because he sits at the right hand of the Father making intercession for us, we can come before him in prayer knowing that he hears and answers our prayers. Who will be first to either share a testimony, a good news, or a prayer request? Yes, Mary. Uh, I want to thank God for all the prayers He's answered me about my grandson. Amen. Amen. I've had two friends who have been missing children, um, one of whom was a, a young man who's grown. But she posted this morning he's been found and is alive. She didn't know if he was alive or dead. So that's one. And my friend Ashley from my job, her daughter is home. She's been Amen. missing for several days. And she's home today. So two families where the lost have been found for Easter. I'm grateful for so many people who have been the hand and the feet and the voice of Christ in my life in the last week. We just been uh, and many of them on the street right now. Melda and Paige and Jeremy and Tracy and yourself, John. Uh, and I'm just so thankful that we do serve this group of Lord who makes us a family, who makes us a community. Amen. And we're thankful for David's good prognosis. Even though he's got hard times to go through, we're grateful. Also, our friend Margaret is having surgery this week, and I'm grateful she's here with us, but we need to keep her in prayer as she goes through surgery and rehab. Let's look to the Lord in prayer and uh, we'll spend some time in prayer together and pray aloud if you feel led or silently. And I'm going to ask Oliver Mark if he would close our prayer time. We thank you, our God and Father, that you are a God who hears and answers prayers. And even when we uh, stumble and don't know how to pray or how exactly what to pray for, that uh, the Holy Spirit takes our thoughts before you and Jesus intercedes for us and that he is our faithful and merciful high priest. We give thanks for all the answers to prayer. We thank you for David's recuperation. He's able to be with us today. We ask for Margaret as she goes for surgery. We are thankful for Tracy's co-worker that the daughter has returned safely. Thank you that you're caring for Mary and she's feeling better. And we just ask, Lord, that whatever our needs and whether they're unspoken or been expressed in some way, we know, Lord, that you hear and answer our prayers and you care for us each and every day. In Jesus' name. How blessed we are to have such a loving Lord. You proved it when you went to the cross for us. You proved your love for us by taking those nails, by going to the grave. And most of all, by rising again. 
to show us that there's life in you. Lord, we thank you for the gifts that you give us. We thank you for every breath that we take. We thank you for your generous love that you spread upon us. When you help us, when we're in need. <coughs> when you show us the way, when we're lost. And when you pour your love upon us, when we're in need. What a loving God we have on this very day that we celebrate your rising from the dead. Lord, we thank you for everything that you've done. We see it in Mary's prayers regarding our grandson, regarding the gifts that you have given her. We hear it in Tracy's thoughts of her friends who had loved ones return this very day. We see it when David is so thankful for those who cared for him And for those who have been there for him through the, the love of Christ. And then we come to you with our prayers for Margaret as she goes to this surgery. That you guide those physicians as they do what they need to do to help her. Lord, we all have experienced you touching our lives in many ways. It is this time that we come to you and say, thank you, Lord, for loving us so much, for being there for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. receiving his tithes and our offerings. We thank you, Lord, for equipping us to make a living, for taking care of our families, and just now as we give back to your work, we pray that you would bless each gift and each giver and use all for the work of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
has two of my choir members. There's Lynn. Anybody know where Janet went? She left already. Okay. She had a family. Okay. I'm on the front. Page.